Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the first, I feel it's like the autumn sessions of the uh, Retuning Your Firm. It's been um, a quiet August. We just had a couple of sessions. Uh, both went really well, I think, and now we're really gearing up for weekly shows looking well. Let's let's see how long it goes, um, as long as the pandemic lasts, I suspect. But hey, that's a long piece of string, I think, for most people at the moment. So welcome, everybody, and particularly to episode eight. And um, <clears throat> for those of you who had a chance to do so. I hope you enjoyed your informal network in Remo, uh, which again is open from, as you probably gathered from the end of this session and who's on today. Well, what's we're going to talk about today? There are three th things we wanted to talk about today, I think. One was what's going on with city center property markets. Um, it's very much in the news at the moment. Um, clearly, if, they, if the office workers don't return to the office, the people who support the office workers are going to find themselves relatively unemployed and we have seen Pretz and many other people making uh, commercial decisions around that perspective. Uh, sector trends, we're going to be doing the poll shortly which we'll be looking at what's happening in the sector and around activity, around uh, income levels and also around attitudes towards returning to the, uh, to the office. And lastly and possibly quite importantly London, London kind of has a hugely important impact on the UK and um, they often say that if uh, London catches something and the rest of the UK really notices it. We're certainly the key, key funder of the rest of the UK if you look at the, the way the tax system works. And uh, it's also the professional services hub of the UK, no question about that. So delighted that um, going through to our speakers, we have Jordan Cummings, who is going to be uh, talking to us about London from the CBI perspective. Uh, and then Chris Blythe, who as you know, is former chief executive of the Justin Mitchell Building, will be talking around the whole area of the um, we thought it was going to be office market, but actually broader. It's the city centre market, really, that we're focusing on. Um, and then welcome back, Francesca. Um, sunshine on a beautiful blue sky today. Anyway, out here it is, certainly in Heart, East Hearts. And again, welcome to Jeremy as the managing partner of Hayes McIntyre, who always brings that that dose of reality. And yep, let's give it a go and see how it goes. I like that attitude to life, very positive. So thank you. And myself, obviously, yours truly, Richard Chaplin. Found the chief exec of the managing partners forum. So that's the uh, that's the lineup for today's call. Uh, obviously, looking forward to uh, uh, getting your input very shortly. Let me just remind you about some of the things that we found are really helpful <clears throat> um, <clears throat> when you're dealing with retuning your firm. Thinking big, uh, as Lewis Carroll says, believe six impossible things before breakfast. Remember when we're talking about relationships, and we are the need to reciprocate. Otherwise, you're just running in a dress book, and that isn't really a relationship. Thinking small, thinking about the angles that are going to resonate with your key audiences. Professions seem to be doing pretty well. I mean, that's the message we're getting last week from the banks, but you've still got to be relevant. So what are the angles that really resonate with your key clients and your people? There's a number of audiences that all firms need to serve. Think about campaigning uh, rather than a series of one-offs. Think about how you can convert the audience into a community. This is the 23rd episode we've done. So, <clears throat> yep, this is a community, not much question of that. Um, think about new ways of doing things. The convention doesn't always work. The context may have changed, so it may no longer be viable. Um, think about doing things quickly. Um, I know a lot of people are now into planning mode, but you've got to be, you can't take nine months as perhaps the MBA would like you to do. So you've got to articulate and market test your assumptions. And if they prove invalid, and they will, because uh, it's like any scientist will tell you, an experiment is normally going to fail. And then it's when it succeeds that they get, oh, that's interesting. And, but if they prove invalid, amend and then pivot in a new direction, and that depersonalizes it. And that's really important. And lastly, I always think be entrepreneurial. Keep listening and innovating. And most people, when they think about entrepreneurs, think about the word innovate. I actually think the word listening is more important because if you're not listening to your clients, how are you sure that you're going to be delivering them the services that they really want? So some so kind of key strategies, and I'd like to thank Alina Kutsko of Globsec, Bratislava. Back in April, very, very sort of prescient she was, I think, because they've really stood the test of time, those ones. So let's have a look at what happened last week. We did, or last, sorry, two weeks ago, let's be accurate. Um, if you recall, we had Dan Payne of um, an organization, well, from Network Rail, struggling with a train crash in Scotland, poor guy, but he's the GC there. But more importantly, he also is the leader of an organization, of a sort of campaign called the OSHEP Lawyer. <clears throat> and there are kind of three things that they, uh, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> have you a drink? They, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, there are three things that they really focused on. They said, be adaptable. That's the first four round here. Build relationships 
and then create value. And those were the three things. And what we were looking at here was the higher the number, the better the, fit, the, better the place. So there were some areas around 3.8 continuous learning, which clearly firms were not, if you like, dealing with in the way that clients would be comfortable about. And this is about doing new things and do things a different way, constantly learning. And there are others um, like uh, building relationships and comms where firms felt they were doing better. So that one, again, will shortly be available to diagnostic. So you can go in and test it yourself. My apologies. Sorry. So anyway, that was the feedback from last week, uh, two weeks ago on advisor skills when dealing with clients. And it was great to have a client perspective as well. I think it's all too often we can get a bit insular in our, in our sort of management roles. So, so why do we the polls? Well, your, your results are incredibly valuable according to uh, the government. So hopefully that's something that will be uh, analysis will be useful. So today's poll, um, it's the tracker, which I think a number of you will have done before. So which is the one that's going to be the number one, increasing operational efficiency. I don't think there's any change on that at all. And the other ones that come in through high are skills capabilities, clear purpose and strategy. Interestingly, apart from operational efficiency, that's not dissimilar to the same results we had back in February pre-lockdown, seems an age ago, but actually the business priorities haven't fundamentally changed. And in a way that makes a lot of sense, I think, because you know, at the end of the day, uh, clearly priorities shouldn't change. Um, the context may, but there. In terms of level and dip, uh, again, it's very similar. I think we had about, if I recall about 66, maybe two thirds being either none or 10%, and now it's crept over 70%. So again, there's a, there's an, a general improvement in terms of the way that people are looking at what's gonna happen over the next 12 months. In terms of the whole area of contraction, uh, so 50% are looking at contraction. And <clears throat> that's um, expansion though has gone way back to a mere 14%. Now that is a dramatic shift from last time, because if you recall, uh, last time we looked at that, the, the contraction, the expansion were, weren't very far apart. Now that's a, that's a, that's a huge shift. So we, that's something that's really worth exploring. When it comes to new work, very much the same message, looking at it, 18% uh, expansion, and doing my math quickly, 53% looking at contraction. Headcount, uh, again, um, again the same sort of messages so there's clearly been a significant shift in attitudes around what's going to happen uh, in terms of the next year for those three key areas activity headcount and new workflow in terms of the people who are likely to be in the office uh, no one in other words everybody's back in the office four percent that's not dissimilar to a month ago uh, Everyone has crept up a little bit, I think, of how, without looking at the detail. Uh, around half is now the sort of medium. And I think, I think if I recall, around three quarters was slightly, slightly ahead. So there's a slight movement between half and three quarters, but there's still a significant group, nearly 20% of people who say that everyone will still be working from home by the end of December 2020. And we'll, we'll talk about some of the implications of that with um, Chris's input in a minute. In terms of general mood, um, yeah, we had nobody relaxed last month, so there's a little bit more relaxation there, but still a very significant 70% are apprehensive. I think it was about 80% a month ago. Uh, in terms of office space requirements, now that has shifted a little bit. Um, about the same is now beginning, beginning to resurface, whereas the uh, less space, and if you remember back in a month or so ago, the more than 30% less, more than less was a big number, now it's zero. In terms of the constraints that most preventing your firm in actually doing anything, the economic outlook is very, very high. And the one that again came in last month, we hadn't even bothered to run it a year ago, is the financial health of your client base. And that again remains a pretty significant barrier for people to actually achieve the optimal performance in the current economic climate. Uh, and finally, what, what, are the, what are people actually talking about in your board meetings? What are the things that carry the most weight during the partner direct discussions? Finance and cash flow are very much top of the list there. And everybody, nobody's talking about sustainability or no one's talking about uh, the supply chain, very, very little about public policy. Sorry about that, Jordan, uh, given it's your space. Um, but the, the, the real focus, I think, is again on finance, cash flow, 
uh, performance clients uh, and the people and firms employers. So there's there's a number of areas which are clearly that. So I'll stop sharing now. Um, hopefully that's given the panel something good, interesting to get their teeth into. And I'll now, if I may, uh, stop sharing my own screen and I'll invite Chris to come and give us his thoughts on what's going on with the, the office market. Well, Richard, thank you very much indeed for that. And as ever, uh, Richard uh, throws a, a low ball in and slightly varies the brief uh, five minutes before you start. But what I'm going to cover over the next five minutes is the three, three aspects of you know, city centre property, that's retail, office and residential, because I think, think sometimes think that when you're talking about city centre property, it's about retail and office. And the one word that drives everything in this, and I'm sure Jordan will probably agree with me on this, is football. If people aren't about, then businesses can't operate. And one of the big drivers in city centres, in terms of footfall, are people in the offices. They come in, they come to work, they buy the services, and they go. It also means that you know, there's a viable level of business available within the city centres, not just at lunchtime, through the evenings. And with our growing amount of residential that we have in some of these big city centres, these residential occupants now depend on that infrastructure being there in the evening. And if you only have to go down to places like Canary Wharf and just see how desperate things are, it's a pretty, it's not a great place now, even in the evening, because a lot of the vibrancy has disappeared because the footfall that would normally have been created by people coming to work, staying around and even socialising, particularly during the summer, that has gone. And it's making those communities, which people paid a lot of money for, you know, far more difficult. And uh, uh, we'll see how that pans out. But with the lack of people coming into town, it does make it more difficult. And we've heard the well-publicized closures. I mean, Richard mentioned pret a manger We've also seen the, the places at the railway stations all cutting back, if not shut down completely. And it comes back to one of the issues that was raised in, in the poll just now around the, you know, one of the priorities is the financial health of your clients. If all these firms are going bust, eventually it will have an impact on you as the professional advisor. If you've got no clients, you've got no business. So there is, an, and I understand the government's drive to get people back into, into the offices and getting people back into the city centres. Um, it does make a big difference. It makes a big impact and it has an opportunity to keep the economy going. London is probably the worst of all of the major cities around Europe at the moment, even in North America. We've probably got about 30 to 35 percent of people back in the office in places like uh, Shanghai and Frankfurt, what have you, it's over 80 percent. Now, it could be a factor that we were slower getting into uh, lockdown, but we certainly seem to be a lot slower coming back. And some of the big employers have said they don't see a majority of their people coming back before the new year. It's actually quite worrying because you just wonder what's going to be left at the end of, uh, at the end of all of this. Um, there's talk about off, uh, retail uh, rentals dropping by some 40%, and that's if people can actually rent out uh, properties. Uh, there's going to be a lot of uh, closed space at the moment, and there's lots of uh, firms trying to negotiate with landlords to either dump property or um, just maintain the ones where there is a reasonable footfall. And it's quite interesting when you go out of London, uh, town centres are very busy. There's lots of footfall, there's lots of business being done. In, in London, I, I still think the office space in London will, will bounce back and I think people are optimistic looking at what the architects are doing. Uh, developers are always looking at the slightly longer term and I think what we'll see happening is office space that is currently being redeveloped and, and, and looked at in terms of climate change being taken forward and looking in the wider area of well-being and making sure that they are fit and better places for people to work in. So that's going to have an impact. But the one thing that worries me more than anything is all this residential. And without infrastructure there to support it, um, it could be very difficult. And this is where we have a lot of people, young professionals working, the people who work for you could find themselves in properties which they can't sell and can't move out of. Uh, because if there isn't a viable base in these city centres where we've got a lo lot of uh, young professionals working, it can be a real issue. And I think it's something which, you know, senior managers in professional firms and so on should be thinking about because they need to think about a long-term strategy, not just about what's happening in the immediacy. And with that, Richard, I'll pass back to you. 
Thanks, Chris. Um, Chris is sort of on holiday in New York at the moment, back in his home home county. So looking very happy for that too. Um, <coughs> excuse me, Jordan. Come and give us your take from the CBI around where um, where London fits in, because obviously Chris has raised London as being a particularly key issue in terms of this property uh, aspect. Thanks, Richard. Um, yeah, and thanks for having me. There's. It's fair to say that it's. Um, it's not rosy out there, I think is, is quite fair to say, just to give people an idea of where we are economically before I drill down into the city, because they are linked. Um, you know, the last quarter we were talking about 20% contraction in the economy, that 17% down from pre-pandemic. Um, cost pressures that came out in the poll just a minute ago um, do chime quite closely with our surveys. Firms are facing huge fixed costs, property, labour, insurance. Um, and it's particularly painful in some sectors. So I think we know that about 80% of manufacturers are still below capacity on very similar overheads to what they were before the pandemic. So there's a real cost pressure there. Um, the GRS, which London has used uh, quite considerably uh, among some sectors, uh, has saved upwards of 10 million jobs, but that's going to tail off um, at the end of October. So we're looking at, uh, in our discussions with the Treasury and then other policymakers at the moment, whether or not we can transition that to some kind of sectoral support, but it obviously costs a lot of money. Um, so there is some there is some pushback on that. Um, so, I mean, if you combine all of that, it's quite clear that there was always going to be a difficult trading environment. Um, London has its own distinct set of challenges. So I think London is projected to be about 19 or 20 percent down in terms of GBA by the end of the year. Uh, so that there is a clear correlation between the economic performance of the UK and the economic performance of London. Um, and, our econo and our economy in London, as Chris alluded to, is uh, really quite interconnected. So we rely quite heavily on the fact that service sectors service other service sectors. Um, and many people in uh, professional business services can work from home. So a lot of that economic activity is happening, but it's not happening in zone one as it was before. But all of the, all of the tertiary economy around those those firms uh, can't work from home. So those consumer services that people take up uh, when they go into the office uh, cannot happen, which is one of the key drivers as to why the CBI has been weighing into the back to, back to office debate. It's also worth saying that a lot of the people who work in that tertiary economy are disproportionately the lowest paid in the economy. So um, we are, we're already looking at kind of widespread job losses, potentially when the JRS tails off later in the year. Um, so having an eye on those, uh, those interconnected sectors uh, is really really quite important but i guess in terms of the recovery which is our kind of job now to look at uh, how london can kind of recover itself there are a few enablers i think for the city that we need to have kind of front and center of our mind we have a major reliance on the transport network it's a fantastic integrated transport network um, but most uh, major zone one employees rely quite heavily on getting their staff there via the tube and the overground network TfL ridership was down by about 90% in May. Uh, their fare box plummeted, so they were quite close to collapse. Uh, a long-term funding settlement is going to be critical to make sure that people can physically get into the office. We have a world-renowned university sector, which relies quite heavily on overseas uh, confidence for people to come here and study. That is also under threat. Financially, councils have deficits of several billion that they've seen uh, over several years now, and they haven't been getting any better. Uh, so the ability at borough level uh, to, to do kind of business engagement and reach out, um, reach out work is, is kind of hampered. And as Chris alluded to, again, consumer behavior shifting could really affect the fabric of zone one, um, which leads me to my point on sectors. We have a sectoral reliance on some of the heaviest hit uh, sectors in, in the country. So retail and hospitality, fashion, the creative industries, and uh, one that keeps getting overlooked in some conversations is the, the impact of aviation and our airport hubs on kind of bringing freight in and out of the city. Um, so all of these are kind of looking to be tackled by the mayor and the treasury and, and we're working quite, quite closely with those people on, on practically what are the levers uh, at kind of local government and national government level to help firms uh, kind of navigate some of this impact. But I guess we would be redress in not discussing the dreaded B word, which is going to come around again quite quickly. Um, and uh, it's fair to say that we are still campaigning for uh, a deal. Any form of deal is better than no deal. London has a heavy reliance on obviously professional financial services that have a heavy reliance on um, trade with the European Union. So avoiding that cliff edge at the end of December is, is critical. Um, there are quite a lot of firms who've done a lot of no deal planning. We've launched a transition hub to help firms, um, but there are going to be extra costs for a lot of firms. So those cost pressures that came out in the 
uh, in the poll a minute ago are probably not going to get better as a result of Brexit, uh, but there is no surprise there. And then finally, I just say in terms of services in London, um, in the last survey we did in August, um, volumes of activity, profitability, um, and investment confidence were all falling in across service sectors, but specifically in person consumer services again, like I mentioned before. Um, and it's worth saying that in our survey from August, professional and business services employment rate dropped at the fastest rate uh, since 2009. So there have been some elements, social media, tech, consulting, that have seen some green shoots throughout uh, throughout the pandemic. But but by and large, we're looking at volumes and and employment levels dipping, which as we go into the autumn is, is really something to, to watch out for. Um, so I'll leave it there. So just not to depress everyone entirely, um, but there are some key enablers for growth. There are some key enablers for growth, forgive me, uh, for London that I think we should, we should, um, we should keep an eye on. Uh, and that's not before talking about mass testing, but that's a discussion perhaps for another day. Yeah, we run this session every week and you'd think that we cover everything, but gosh, you've there's so many elements you've picked up there, Jordan. Thank you very much. It was really helpful and insightful, obviously totally on top of your agenda and good luck with your conversations with Treasury and uh, the Mayor and others. Francesca, come and talk to us today and uh, we've been a bit depressing now. I know you're always great at changing the mood. What, what, do, you have to, what do you have to tell us about today? I must admit, well, thank you to, to Jordan and to Chris for that. I did sort of wonder if I should open the drinks cabinet um, and just a, sort of a stiff, stiff brandy just to see you for the morning. Um, well, let's see. There, there, there's two things that really strike me and I, and, I, and I think there's an intriguing piece around that disconnect between the service industries that are, are really um, predicated on people being in offices. And uh, I know many people have said this in, in public commentary of going, I'm not going to go back to work to say pret a um, And you can understand why people are going, mm, in the greater scheme of things, is that just a dead model? And do those businesses need to find a different way of operating? And I think that's the big challenge for us now is that you've got a whole, um, a whole infrastructure, a whole ecosystem that's based on something that just doesn't feel like it's going to be ever quite the same. So talking there about 30% occupancy in London, say that creeps up to 50%, one would imagine it's never going to get back to what it was, it will be somewhere in between where it is now and upwards. So that means some businesses clearly are not gonna survive. There's, there's no way that all the various service industries, I mean, if I, uh, from the office, I, I work in Fenchurch Street, that's the walkie talkie building, that funny sort of shaped building. And um, you walk out the door and there's about 25 coffee shops uh, within two minutes walk. That clearly isn't gonna be a successful model uh, with the occupancy we're going to get and people aren't going to go back to offices because it's going to take them an hour to get into the lift in a social distance way into their floor they can see all sorts of issues around that so, so there's something intriguing to hear about that sort of uh, diffused situations so are you going to have a way that you've got more people who go i really want to work from home I really want to. I want to work from home. I think that's better for my life. I think I can do most of my job there. But they're coming in to whatever the office space was just less frequently. So it, that, you can begin to see that shift where people go, I don't mind coming in two days a week. I certainly don't want to come in five days a week. And to Chris's point, if you're a young professional and you're in very expensive accommodation in London and your infrastructure is looking a bit shaky, how many people are, are looking maybe I'll move 45 minutes away and I'll get a much cheaper accommodation that's nicer uh, in terms of space or in terms of environment. Because if I'm only coming to the office a couple of days a week, I don't need to be so close to say London or so close to an urban centre. So that shift is really intriguing. A lot of our people are going, well, if I don't need to come in every single day, I don't need to be living a tube, tube distance away. I don't need to be in zone one or zone two. Um, I don't need to be living on the outskirts of a big urban centre. So there's something, I think it's a really good challenge for us about where our future is going to be and, and, and what is it that we're actually saying to the teams that we work with, the people that we work with. Do you actually um, any longer need to insist that uh, people live within immediacy of an urban centre if they're not coming in every single day? And, and so you see many organisations go for that shift of you work at home by default or we'll open our office in a year's time so um, it, it's a massive impact though on the the transition that any change is so painful and I think what we're going to continue to see is the existing ecosystem 
um, is just simply not coping at the moment. Will it get to a place where some of it reinvigorates itself, reinvents itself, and some of it simply won't survive? And it's going to be a, a hybrid of those, I reckon, Richard. Yeah, and I think one of the other areas interesting, we'll pick it up in a second, is the extent to which uh, project teams, which perhaps traditionally were always kind of centred in the same place, can become much more disparate. Um, now, again, I know Jeremy would like to come and join us now and give your thoughts. And you were a couple of weeks ago, I think, kind of maybe three were saying you felt that maybe the July exuberance was a little bit sort of, you know, everyone was being positive. Maybe it was just thinking about holidays or something. Um, but now, now that we're sort of uh, back in the reality of September and a few months away from the B word, using what Jordan said. Um, so, so what's your take uh, as the sort of uh, resident managing partner on the panel? So, OK, thank you, Richard. Good morning, everyone. Um, I, I suppose just perhaps to give a bit of a bit of an overview as to where we are at the moment, you may recall that we did a trial to for three days, uh, two or three weeks ago to reopen the office and we are formally reopening um, on Monday um, for four, four days, Monday through to Thursday and we've split everyone into two teams, A and B. Um, and A is in on Monday and Wednesday, B is in on Tuesday and Thursday, and there is science behind those split days as opposed to consecutive days. Um, I was really keen that we got some momentum around getting back to the office, and it is still very much purely on a voluntary basis. No one has to come in um, at all, so everyone has to feel comfortable, but I felt it was important that we got some momentum to, to come back into the office um, for a variety of reasons. Um, I think from a, from a business reason, uh, we're, we're, we're just as productive um, with people working at, from home, but in certain areas of the business, we're not as efficient. So we're still doing the hours, we're probably doing more hours, but the efficiency is not there. And, th and that might be a number of factors. That might be simply remote working, that might be a client factor, et cetera, et cetera. So, so there's that to address, but also I feel very strongly that there's a real social and mental issue here about people needing to get back and see colleagues and being in the work environment. And I agree with Francesca, we're definitely gonna have a hybrid model. We're definitely gonna have people working in the office less than they previously used to. But there's a lot of people we talk to, a lot of our guys we talk to who are keen to come back and have that social interaction. We have, um, I can't remember the percentage, but I, but I think it, it, it's around 50% of our staff are under 30. So their, their social life and their work life are very intertwined. And I'd pick up just on Chris's point, and Francesca made the point about the the accommodation and where they live. I think there is still a desire by that, uh, those younger, my younger colleagues to still be close to London, um, even recognizing that they're working at home and they have to have the right environment to work in home and that might change what, what, they, what they need. Um, but there's still a desire, I think, to be close to London and therefore close to their friendship groups, which is invariably the people they work with. Um, at, at that age. So, so perhaps just a counter to, to what Chris and, and, and Francesca were saying, I, I think, yeah, I think some people will say, do I really need to be in London? I suspect those are the people at the upper end of that age band and perhaps over the 30 with perhaps younger families or, or whatever, who are, who are creating a new social network to say, yes, I can be further out of London now, I'm only commuting a couple of days a week. But I, but I think our younger colleagues probably still have a desire to, be, to, to remain quite central. Um, in terms of business activity, August is always a difficult month to judge. Um, it, it's, been, it's been a tough month for us from a, from a, from a billing point of view. Um, uh, but you, you know it, that happens. There's holidays. There's various factors at play there. So we're really hopeful that come September, reopening of the office, um, uh, we will we'll see some real momentum and get some some real push forward in that regard. In terms of those split teams, 
the idea behind Monday and Wednesday, we're, we're very much, there's a science behind splitting the team so that people who normally work together are in on the same day. And the opportunity certainly again for the younger colleagues to who dependent on that on the job training, they're in on a Monday. We we talk about what work needs to be done during the week. They can go away, do some work on Tuesday, back on Wednesday for a follow-up, and then through to the end of the week. So that's the logic behind the split, the split week in terms of ensuring that there's a couple of touch points at the week as opposed to just two at the start or two at the end. Thanks, Jeremy. That's great. Uh, it kind of reminds me of something I was reading about recently where they said in financial services, the trend had been up to lockdown that the whole of a specialist team kind of all sat together and worked together. And then, of course, all of them went down with COVID, uh, which was kind of difficult for their business model. Jordan, do you want to give some any broader perspectives on Jeremy's obviously given us his really interesting take as to how they, as a mid-sized accountancy firm, are approaching this uh, re-engaging with office and their like many accountancy firms, the median age is below 30. I think that's true for most professional firms, quite frankly. Uh, so do you want to give some thoughts on that from a broader perspective, Jordan? Yeah, so we're seeing um, very similar things to Jeremy. I think uh, one thing that keeps coming out is really understanding the drivers for, for a workplace for these, for these uh, uh, younger members of staff. Historically, especially in London, um, the, the kind of social contract is you sit on a pack train for 45 minutes and but the, the reward for doing so is that you get to work in a big shiny office full of other young people and then you can learn a lot of things um, and that is a contract that we have kind of all struck for many years and kind of have been happy to do um, I think if it's going to change we need to we do need to as Francesca says fundamentally, um, fundamentally reassess what we're doing in those offices are they going to become collaboration spaces are they going to host other types of activities rather than just being a location in which you do the processes of your job which I think we're hearing from a lot of the larger firms who have a great deal of commercial space uh, who are unlikely to be able to use that at 100% going forward. That being said, as divisive and sometimes polarising as the kind of return to office debate has been in recent weeks because it's kind of challenging the assumption that we all need to subscribe to the old model, there are some uh, offices who have been going great guns and putting people back in there quite quickly because the, the demand from the workforce is quite clearly there. We have one very large member uh, with office space in zone one who has kind of taken a, a, the approach uh, that every day that you come into the office is kind of like Christmas Day and they have a welcome back team and they have people going around with coffee and they really want to incentivize people being back in because they ticked all of the health and safety and distancing boxes. And I think um, that's the kind of space where the debate needs to get to. I don't think we're mandating everyone to come back in, but really understanding that if there is a segment who can come back safely, um, then it shouldn't be beyond the realms of possibility to have that discussion. Um, but it's fair to say that I think even among the largest members, it is, it is a kind of split sentiment on whether or not this is a good idea. Um, and, you, and you're you kind of always coming up against the, the, the social need versus the kind of economic need to have people back, um, if that makes sense. Yeah, and picking up the health and safety point, I mean, one of the sort of things that a lot of people are working from their home uh, wouldn't normally be in compliance with your typical health and safety. Now, if you actually look at the sort of uh, working from home policies that firms are now beginning to roll out, one of the key elements there is that you've got to make sure that that space is a suitable, safe space. I mean, confidentiality has obviously been very high in many people's minds, but just making sure that actually the space they're in is the one which they can indeed uh, be safe in and management has a responsibility under all sorts of different laws to, to do that. And I think at the moment that issue has been kind of waived, but this idea that we can, everybody can suddenly work from home and there are no implications, I think uh, is probably a little bit um, unhelpful. Um, yeah. Chris, you're, do you want to give some thoughts on that? I'll come back to Francesca in a minute. Yeah, sure okay. there is. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's a very valid point because not everybody can satisfactorily work from home. And if you're if you're in a, a house share or a flat share and you you know there's five four or five of you all competing um, to, to create space to work from home, it can be very very difficult. So um, yeah, I, I I I understand that. I I do feel though that you know it, there's a big danger that we're we're looking at the the short term rather than the long term. And I think if employers really make an effort to get things like their workplaces COVID secure, I think it'll have a major impact on well-being in general, because I think 
the measures that you do, for example, to make sure your COVID secure will also mean that you're flu secure, you're cold secure. There's all those other things. And I think maybe, you know, over the last few years, we've actually got a bit lax on hygiene across the country. And maybe this COVID thing is just a, a kick in the pants. Uh, we've crammed too many people into spaces which are too small, which enables things to pass. As you mentioned, Richard, you know, if someone gets ill and everyone gets ill. Maybe we do need to go back to having a little bit more space and maybe some of the reconfigurations that the offices will take place will give people a bit more space where we can actually have do more to deal with the well-being. So dealing with the well-being in the office, but if you choose to work from home or work remotely, that your well-being is properly looked after there. Because, and that's long term. It's got to be done long term because if you're going to have a, a work from home or work remotely policy, then well-being needs to be at the forefront of uh, you know the drive. It's not just about operational efficiency or people just having a, a, a having an option rather than uh, that becomes a lifestyle choice. Francesca, I, I kind of interrupted <clears throat> you before, but hopefully um, didn't spoil oh, your train no, of thought. No, no, no. It's not, no, not at all, not a problem. Because um, there's so many different elements coming through from this. Um, I, I mean, picking up on, I'll, I'll go back to Jeremy's point, but it's a really valid one. The, the older you are, the less attractive living in the city can become if your driver is around maybe a, a, a bigger house, bigger garden, young right. family, different kind of lifestyle. And I think Jeremy's absolutely right that the more your life is predicated around London, um, or a big urban centre, the more attractive it is to live near the city. Um, I mean, I know, and I think Joanna put a great question in there around, um, it is a generational piece. And also it's about if you quite like going out in the evening, uh, big urban centres, choices of restaurants, different things to go and do, and then go home, uh, you still need to be within uh, spitting distance of an urban centre to be able to do that. Uh, Many people, particularly taking London, you've probably got an hour's journey in the evening after you go home. Um, and, and but you, So you want to be within that radius to enable you to still enjoy the fruits of being in an urban centre to work. So I think it, it, but it does really shift some of that, that thinking. Um, I, I guess the, the, the piece that strikes, that really strikes me is that, are we trying to recreate the model that we used to have do we have to bring some completely different thinking in here? And uh, you, as you rightly say, if you're going to work at home by default, we've waived all the health and safety rules for the moment, but you've got to make sure that's a good working environment for people and a safe work environment. But are we also just missing some of the different opportunities we've got? Do you want an office at all? Do you need an office space at all? Do you need a different kind of working space? Do you need a different kind of collaborative centre? Do you need all the ways that we've been thinking for the last oh forever um i was i was joking with one of my colleagues last one from you richard i was joking with one of my colleagues 20 for the last 25 years i've been saying that come the revolution we won't have offices because they make no sense they're really expensive they're very they're very destructive in some of the ways that they operate and they're and they're all about presenteeism and they're all about being for, you know, going into battery-like environments. And I think the revolution has just arrived. And I think there's some really positive things about it, but we are going to have to think completely differently in relation to some of the things that we do to, to succeed in this. And we can't, um, we can't just assume we can take the old model and, and slightly tweak it. There are gonna be a couple of elements of it where I think we really will have to challenge ourselves about what, are we, what is the end game we're trying to achieve and how can we do that in the current environment? Sure. Jordan, you're, you're a policy person. I mean, how do you react to that kind of more philosophical perspective from Francesca? I think it's a fair, I think it's a completely fair challenge. I think the, the quite frankly, the office structure mirrors the economic structure we have, which is get as many people in one place to produce as much things as they possibly can. Um, whereas actually you can disperse the same amount of people to disperse probably the same amount of output. And I think that when I say, um, it's good for young people here to come into the office and you know to serve that kind of social contract. Um, they're more more along the lines of the learning, mental health, culture of work elements rather than always the kind of economic productivity output. I think many people would say that they've been more productive not having to spend four hours on a train every day than they would if they were commuting. Um, and I know that's one for me too. Um, I do think that it would take 
uh, if you were talking about something that wasn't market led and you wanted a kind of government led response, it would take a real fundamental shift in the way in which we view the economy, I think. Um, and you would have to accept some pain. And as we've said, as Chris said, you would, you would have to accept some kind of city centre pain for a while as you disperse people out to do more remote working and you create things like 15 minute cities, which is something that comes up quite, uh, quite a lot these days in terms of creating economic hubs further away from city centres. Um, so that you have everything within 15 minutes, including just the place of work. Um, it would also fundamentally challenge uh, the levers that firms have themselves to help people to do more remote working who can't do it at home. So for people who live in house shares, who couldn't remote work uh, for a long period of time, who might need to use something like a WeWork or an external space, how are they paying for that? And how is that offset against their employment package? Are, is, their employment, is their employer able to help or not? So there are quite a lot of things to consider if we are going to be actively taking people out of the the kind of um, sunk cost office space that we already have. Um, I do think that there's not a great deal of government thinking, I would say at the moment on this, in terms of a long-term economic strategy for moving people away from urban centres. Um, but if we were gonna get there, I think that it's something that probably someone like a treasury and MHCLG would probably do as, as a partnership. And the, and the tax system, obviously in terms of uh, benefits and being taxed on a car, even if you can lock it in a garage with a yeah. padlock and everything like that, or you can't incur costs to change your house to make it suitable for home working, that's not tax deductible, et cetera, et cetera. I think there's a whole bunch of structural issues which come in the way. Yeah. Can I just pick up Mike's ask a question, which again, I think if you're okay to answer it, Jordan, around localized lockdowns. I mean, what, what's the sort mm -hmm. of feedback you're getting across your CBI members around those who are having to cope with special with localized lockdowns? What, what's, is there any particular issues there that worthy worth sharing? Yeah, so I think the main message is they are, um, uh, incredibly frustrating where the government isn't communicating the, the kind of sc the full scope of the lockdown as soon as is humanly possible. So we've been pushing them uh, for some time to get from local to hyper local. So instead of we locking down the whole of Glasgow, um, how about we look, we, lock, we look to lock down the segments of Glasgow that are the most affected. Uh, and we do earlier communication with business, especially for the firms that span. So if you take London, for example, um, someone like an Hermes or a DHL, has, has workers in every single borough of London every single day, most likely. So there is quite a high risk for those firms in terms of them moving around. Uh, and the comms with business just hasn't been fast enough. And they have the data. Public Health England does have the hyper-local data, but they've, they've kind of veered away from, from doing it at that kind of lower level so far. And I think the call from businesses is, um, if we can have some clarity as soon as possible on, A, how big the scope is for the kind of local, local areas where we need to be really careful versus a bigger region, uh, and B, where are these decisions really sitting? I think there is some there is some confusion definitely when there is kind of mayoral combined authorities, Public Health England, the National Health Service, the Cabinet Office meetings. Um, I think some members are just searching for a, a kind of consistent basis on which to work when it comes to local lockdowns. Um, who should I be asking about things within my borough versus who should I be asking about things within my region? Um, so I think the, it's mainly a clarity point um there is uh there's some evidence that we have from Leicester that um when you do it too late there's a huge impact on business performance but that's kind of a, a natural correlation um so i think that getting the uh the clarity and the comms out as soon as possible is the main message we're getting at the moment we made we made a toolkit for anyone on the call who might um uh, want to use it on kind of practical steps to think about in terms of local lockdowns so i'm happy to circulate it um but it's it's looking like the way we're going, if we don't get a vaccine, obviously, before kind of Q1, there, there is a possibility that you will see more local lockdowns. And if we can get them smaller uh, and more contained, I think that'll, that'll kind of help more people continue to trade. Uh, picking up that issue of comms for a second, um, Jeremy, you, you've obviously, as managing partner, of somebody who government really is eager to communicate with. I mean, how would you describe the the way that you have been kept informed as to what's going on as the leader of an important firm with based in London? Yeah, I mean, I, I, um, I, I suppose I go out of my way, Richard, to, to, to get involved in various groups, various organisations to make sure that I, that I do hear, hear what's going on and, and hear practically what other people are doing. And this is an example. Um, but I'm involved with other with other groups uh, of accountancy firms, etc., uh, uh, and obviously the institute, and they're all very good sources for 
for for keeping up to date and 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 finding out what what is happening um, at a practical level as well. I did, just coming back to the previous a couple of the previous points that were made. Um, I, I do think, and, and, and perhaps just to, to perhaps bring a bit of balance, I do think we are a business and a profession that thrives on physical interaction with colleagues and clients. Um, and I now I'm not saying that has to be five days a week. Um, and I'm not saying that the office environment won't change and, and, uh, and move away from just rows and rows of desks of people sitting at them all day. Um, but I do think that, as I say, we are, we are a business, we are a profession that, that thrives on physical interaction with each other. And, and, and I don't think we should lose sight of that. Um, obviously, there's, there's a balance and I think we will have this, this hybrid and I think that is going to be really challenging for all firms, I think, how they work through this hybrid situation. Um, but, but it's still important, I think, that we, we, we have that physical interaction as well. Chris, uh, we've kind of looked here, crystal ball, and we're kind of talking about hybrids. We're talking about levels of occupancy, maybe at 50%, because nobody can be waiting now to queue up for the lift or whatever. And you're obviously somebody who really has worked with the property and construction industry, looking at that industry in a broader sense. Where, what, what, what do you think some of the trends are that would impact those on the call who are involved in that sector for, as a business, if you follow the logic? Yeah, well, I, I think the you know, thoughts are already taking place now about redesigning offices and you know, they're coming up at refurbs and, and new build. There's still a lot of uh, new office accommodation being built. There's still a demand for it. So if there's a demand for it, people want it. But I think it'll, it'll get redesigned. They'll, they'll reconfigure it. And I think, as I said at the start, I mean, one of the, the, the drivers before COVID was climate change. And I think you know, health and well-being will be the new drivers. And, you know, and, and will, 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 will rents come down? I think rents, you know, there may need to be a, a structure of having new flexible arrangements. Um, uh, maybe the, the, the way leases have been traditionally done may have to be reviewed because I don't really think that what is there at the moment is sustainable. I mean, the people who are looking to change their configuration, if they've just signed a a 15 or 20 year lease, you're going to be a bit stuck for a bit. Um, those who are um, coming to the end of a, a lease period may have some time to do it, but it, these things take a long time to plan. But I, I think you, one needs to be thinking that maybe the new normal isn't about talking, maybe we shouldn't be talking about 50% occupancy. Maybe we, we're talking about having less people than we traditionally had because actually less people now is the right occupancy level for the, the way we want to operate and uh, and it may cost a bit more i don't know but at the end of the day it's about what's doing right and i think jeremy makes a very valid point particularly in professional services the office place is very key to the culture and to the brand and if you start having an office which is dissipated and it's all remote culture will soon disappear and i think the brand will soon disappear and i think particularly for professional services lawyers accountants will have it the office space is actually very important for culture and brand. And for young people, the, you know, being in the office is a way of getting up the ladder. If you're dissipated out there, you don't have touch and you, you, every firm becomes like the same. And I still think there is a need for an office space to create something that reflects uniquely the culture of the organization. So there'll be changes um, and it, there'll be some substantial changes, but um, it'll take time to work through. It's not going to happen overnight. Francesca, um, a more positive tone there coming from uh, Chris. What, what do you think? Yeah, does culture need an office space to survive? No, I don't think it does. It can amplify, I think it can help. And I get the, it's actually easier. I think what it is, is easier. But do you need it to have a culture? So so I my, um, the teams that I work with most closely, Absolutely none of us live in the same country. We're literally all over the world and um, we get together once a year and we say we don't have a lot of common office space, but we're very connected. And I, I, I think it, you just have to work harder at it. I think it is a more, I think you have to be more thoughtful about it. It's, a, it's 
um, requires a different kind of thinking to make it work. I don't think an office makes a culture. I think culture is driven from much stronger roots than that. I've seen, I've been in many offices where the culture's been awful. <laughs> you know, it's been like a, it's like being a living hell and it certainly hasn't helped the culture at all, nor the brand, nor anyone who lived in it. Um, but I think there's, there's something again that there's a little bit about why, do, why does culture and office get so interlinked? What is it that's happening? There's something around that humanity, that interaction, that social contact, that water cooler moment. There's something about the casual walking down the corridor to talk to somebody. And, and how can you replicate that if you haven't got a physical space? And I think that's the challenge for us. Um, what I love is that organizations like Google, who predicated a lot of their thinking around making the office an awesome place to work, where you wanted to be and you got free suites and yeah, all sorts of amazing things used to go on at that play spaces. And they're one of the first organizations to say, we're not going to go back to that. And yet they invested so heavily. So I think there's something we need to challenge ourselves about. Um, uh, do, do we need an office to do what we need to do? Do we need, what is it that the office gave us? What were those fundamental foundational pieces that helped us to be who we are? And, and, and I guess that's, that's the, those are the, the pieces we need to extract to, to build the new normal. I remember actually when um, we had our friend from Richard, um, from sorry, Richard Rogers, I was gonna say completely the wrong place, excuse me, um, <clears throat> from Foster and Partners um, on the other day. And he was talking about how within a multidisciplinary environment, such as an architectural firm with engineers, they need to spark off each other, they need to bring them together. And they all have such incredibly complex computer systems that the idea of replicating that into homes, the broadband just wouldn't cover it. So, I mean, I think there are certain professional services where bringing people together is critical to the delivery of the product. I think possibly in legal, um, whereas somebody memorably once said the, 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 arch, the building that is designed for lawyers and the building designed for um, people who are interns is the same because they're both full of cells. Um, and that's another story. But, uh, but yeah, I think an accountant's kind of fall in the middle, I guess. But so I think there is an element around the type of thing of work you're actually doing. I think the other point which I can pick up quite often is the what I call the Hawthorne effect. Every, all managers have been really more attentive to their staff over the last six months. And that's hugely positive. And everybody's reacted really positively to that. And that's been, I think, a cause of a lot of the productivity improvements. Um, if we go back to whatever the old normal might have been, uh, will that continue? I hope it will, because I think it's been a sort of shut up the arm to managers to realize that they can't just rely on issuing orders and hoping that people then do them. They really have to engage with people in a whole new way in order to, to get to this. So I think that's a positive coming out of it as well. Anyway, I'd like to thank the panel uh, today for their, um, been a really interesting discussion. We've covered so much stuff as always. Um, you know, is culture dependent on buildings? That's a fascinating one. Well, if you're in Francesca's place, clearly, absolutely not, because everybody on, on that team, as you said, is in different countries, which is probably the extreme in terms of the outliers and other people who kind of, um, like say Jeremy, who has everybody in one office in London, which is at the other end. Um, they both work in different ways, different contexts, different agendas, I guess. So I'd like to thank the, t uh, the panel. I'd like to thank Jordan from the CBI with that fantastic macro perspective. And also, don't worry, Jordan, everybody is <clears throat> aware of some of those nasty things, but if we don't talk about them, then guess what? We won't plan for them. Uh, Francesca is always a bit more philosophical and reflective today, I think. So hopefully you won't need that brandy. Uh, Jeremy, as always, um, you didn't quite answer my question about government comms because you're one of these great guys who goes out and does it themselves. And I suspect a lot of the managing partners who aren't your proactive, energetic type of people will probably uh, be waiting, sitting there waiting to be informed. And Chris, in your, in your happy uh, family uh, county of Yorkshire, thank you for taking time out of your holiday and your flying and everything else you get up to and uh, for giving us the insight on, on what's going on in the property world. And the thing is, I always feel after one of these sessions, we never really answer the questions because we're all dealing in a new area, which we're not really sure about, but we're working together collectively to hopefully inspire people to, as somebody put it to me, they said, yeah, what you're doing is you're, you're making me think. You're making, we're taking me into places that I hadn't really given enough attention to. And so I'd like to thank the panel for that. Bye for now.